Okay, good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank Norbert for the kind introduction and also would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting me to give this uh, plenary talk. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to thank all of you for getting up so early in the morning to listen to my talk. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, the great opportunities and very serious challenges we face in electromagnetic materials characterization and structural health monitoring. Uh, the first slide shows uh, the main technological challenges in this area, and I'm going to concentrate only on the first one really, which is highly relevant for us working in the NDE and monitoring community. Uh, the task is basically to detect as early as possible material degradation uh, caused by operational usage, service loads, and exposure to hostile uh, environments. Uh, although I'm not going to be able to uh, address the, these other issues, I wanted to acknowledge at the beginning uh, how this effort fits into the big picture and remind you that the ultimate goal is, of course, to increase the safe surface life uh, of critical uh, components. The question I'd, I'd like to really discuss in detail is what can we measure accurately enough and reliably enough to be used for life prediction uh, purposes? And more specifically, what can we measure by electromagnetic means? And here I use the term electromagnetic in a rather loose sense as measuring any electrical signal that was produced by an electric, magnetic, or thermal stimulus. At the material level, there are numerous microstructural features we are interested in, and unfortunately there are only very few physical properties of the material we can easily measure. Uh, and the same thing happens at the component state. There are many, many parameters we are interested in. You might notice that most of these are geometrical in nature. They are related to the size and shape of the component or the presence of large delaminations, cracks, uh, that effectively change the shape uh, of the component. And again, only a few things we can measure. Needless to say that th there are higher level variables uh, uh, related to the... Uh, state of the structure, the system, uh, service loads, and environmental variables like temperature that will influence uh, our measurements, but I'm not going to address them in great detail. There are two important problems I'd like to highlight here. The first is pretty obvious. Uh, there's a much larger number of uh, microstructural uh, and uh, component variables that, than the number of physical measurements we can do. Therefore, our measurements will inherently lack selectivity and our results will be inherently somewhat uh, ambiguous in terms of these uh, variables. This is pretty obvious just from the numbers involved. The other problem is maybe a little less obvious. Uh, there is a difficulty in separating true material parameters from geometrical uh, parameters like size and shape. Uh, and I'd like to highlight this problem a little better through the simple example of an electric resistance strain gauge probably everybody is familiar with. When you stretch a gauge like this, you change its resistance, partly because it's getting longer and the cross-section of the wire is getting smaller due to the Poisson effect, but also because of the piezo-resistivity effect, that is, you also change the resistivity. All these effects are relatively small because the strain itself is, is very small. Therefore, you can linearize this equation where F is uh, uh, a measure of the, the sensitivity of the strain gauge, the so-called gauge factor. If you combine the contributions, you find out that uh, the gauge factor has a purely geometrical contribution, 1 plus 2 nu, and, and uh, the piezo resistivity, which is a material contribution. Now, you might have noticed that the gauge factor is always around two or maybe a little higher, and clearly the first two terms will add up to something much less. Poisson's uh, ratio is around 0.3, so it's only 1.6. Uh, th that would be my first uh, important conclusion from the, uh, this, that the material effect might be smaller than the geometrical effect, but it's far from negligible. 
However, this is just the ge direct uh, geometrical effect. Actually, there is a hidden geometrical effect in the piezo resistivity that is the material uh, parameter itself. If you use the simplest classical uh, approximation for electrical conductance, you find out that the resistivity will be inversely proportional to the charge of the free carrier, E, the number density, N, and uh, their mobility, mu. Now, of course, E is just a physical constant, uh, but interestingly, the total number of free charge carriers will not really change significantly when you stretch the material. Uh, therefore, the changing number density is just due to the fact that, that uh, you change the volume of the conductor. So it's, it's essentially a, a, a geometrical effect embedded in the material effect. And the, the true material effect is, is just in the mobility where M is the strain dependence, the strain coefficient of the mobility. If you combine uh, uh, these parameters, you end up uh, with a gauge factor which is just 2 minus M. So the geometric uh, sensitivity is plane 2. And then uh, M is the material effect. And that explains why we shoot for a gauge factor of two. The truth is we could get much higher uh, uh, gauge factors, but then we would sacrifice selectivity for higher sensitivity, which is a very bad deal. Uh, if if uh, F is much bigger than two, it's necessary because of M being a large negative number, and that would make the, the gauge very sensitive to other effects like temperature. And we certainly don't want to do that. Now, in the measurements I'm going to describe in, in my talk, we use the material under test as the gauge material itself. So we don't have this luxury to optimize this effect. It will have always a given combination of geometrical and material contributions. What are the main issues uh, to be discussed here? Uh, well, I listed sensitivity uh, as the first one because everybody uh, would say that, that that's the primary uh, problem, but it's not. The sensitivity is low, but electrical measurements can be done very easily, very accurately. Therefore, whether the signal is small or not is really not an issue. The, the, the more important issues are those which are mentioned already, the lack of uh, selectivity and the, the difficulty uh, of distinguishing between material and geometrical properties. There is another very important problem. Uh, distinguishing between reversible and irreversible changes. Uh, as luck has it, the reversible changes, for instance, due to temperature, are always much bigger than the irreversible ones, which are actually related to the remaining service life of the material. So we have to compensate uh, for the changes in the reversible parameters to get down to what we are interested in. And there are a couple of less important uh, uh, problems. Uh, very often we have non-monotonic relationship between uh, the parameter we can measure and, and uh, the variable we are really interested in. For instance, uh, hardness affects the conductivity, but most of the time in a non-monotonic way that uh, excludes uh, easy uh, inversion. And uh, very often we have a problem with dominance of irrelevant uh, properties, for instance, that could be temperature. If it's a reversible effect like temperature, it's not too bad. Usually you can correct for it. The real problem is when, when this uh, uh, dominance is caused by an irreversible effect. For instance, in austenitic steels, uh, which are nominally non-magnetic, uh, cold work, plastic deformation at low temperatures can produce a martensitic phase, which is highly uh, magnetic, and because the amount of martensite formation at, at a given plastic strain level very much depends on temperature, it's essentially an uncontrolled random influence on your measurements, and really the only thing you can do, you lower your inspection frequency uh, to a point where you are not sensitive to magnetic properties. And of course, you also have many practical problems, which uh, uh, I, I will address when I get to the examples. Current monitoring techniques are very robust, not particularly sensitive. They, they are essentially all based on the current field perturbation technique. Uh, basically, you inject an electric current by either magnetic means or galvanic coupling into the specimen. You try to achieve a more or less uniform current distribution so that if you have a crack or an inclusion, 
some other defect in the material, the current is deflected and you can uh, detect this deflection by mapping the magnetic field uh, external to the specimen or you can put a couple of electrodes uh, on the surface and measure the potentials and map the distortion of the potential field resulting from the presence of uh, the imperfection. Arguable, the, the, the most common technique is ACP, the alternating current potential uh, drop technique. Probably you have heard of it. If you inject the current into a specimen and, and you measure uh, uh, the potential difference between two points appropriately chosen, uh, then, then this potential drop will be proportional to the increasing length, length of the crack. There are commercially available instrument, uh, instruments uh, for this purpose, and the technique works very well both in laboratory and, and field uh, environment. Obviously, there is a big problem. You have to know where the crack is going to form. So if you have a, a starter notch, you know where the crack is going to form. But if you have, for instance, uh, corrosion damage or erosion damage, and, and the, the crack will start from a corrosion pit, th th then you have to populate uh, the critical area by a larger number of electrodes. That technique is called field signature method. And uh, the, the number of electrodes could be well over 100 <coughs> in this case you place. They, they can be spring-loaded electrodes or permanently welded uh, uh, to the structure. And if you evaluate the potential distribution, uh, you can come up with a, a map of the wall sickness loss caused by corrosion or erosion. And uh, of course, uh, for, initiating large cracks uh, uh, would also show up on these images. But it still requires coupling, electrical coupling uh, uh, to the component. You can do this magnetically uh, using, for instance, the magnetic field analysis uh, uh, technique. You still have to inject the current galvanically. Uh, therefore, this technique is, is uh, most often used for pipe inspection, but then the inspection itself could be uh, done uh, around the ground. Uh, these are the points where you inject uh, the current, and, and they can be separated by a couple of hundred uh, meters, where you can actually permanently install some posts for connections, and then uh, you have to scan the magnetic field above ground by an array of magnetic sensors, and uh, major defects in the pipe, corrosion, uh, erosion induced wall sickness, or a dent, or, or a crack, will perturb the current distribution, and you can uh, evaluate that by the perturbation uh, that you see in the magnetic field. Now, you, you might have noticed that all these robust industrial techniques uh, are just detecting geometrical uh, changes, not really material parameters. So the question uh, arises, uh, what can we do about uh, real material properties? Measuring only geometrical uh, properties is good if you are interested in crack growth or, or, or erosion, corrosion, but definitely not if there are no geometrical changes and only material properties indicate the damage. For instance, thermal aging, embrittlement, uh, residual stress buildup, and, and relaxation. Interestingly, very often you need something in between. You need a dual mode technique, which starts out, let's say, measuring uh, only material properties and later becomes sensitive to geometrical variations as well. Fatigue damage characterization is uh, uh, like this, where initially there, there are no geometrical changes, but later when the micro cracks coalesce into large cracks, there, there is actually a change in the geometry. Uh, I will talk about creep damage and show you that it's just the opposite. In that case, first you want to measure geometrical uh, changes and then material changes, because creep damage is done at very high temperature, where, where forming uh, material defects are also healed at high temperature. Therefore, initially, in the primary and early secondary creep ranges, uh, the material changes are very weak and very often non-monotonic. Therefore, monitoring them would not help you. The only thing that really changes monotonically, at least initially, is, is the plastic strain produced by creep. So we use sensors which are initially sensitive to this geometrical effect, and then we, uh, the same sensor becomes uh, sensitive to uh, material damage, which is very important because the strain itself is not going to tell you whether you are uh, directly, whether you are close to the uh, failure or not, but the material damage uh, will. <coughs> 
Okay, so how can we better separate between material and geometrical uh, properties? In conventional potential drop measurements, the easiest thing to do is to control the frequency. If you use very low frequencies, direct current injection or very low frequency uh, injection, then depending on the electrode separation, the current will spread out through the whole cross-section of the specimen, and obviously you will be sensitive to, for instance, wall thickness. By the same token, you are not going to be sensitive very much to the presence of a crack between the sensing electrodes because the perturbation caused by such a crack will be inherently small. However, if you increase the frequency due to the electrodynamic skin effect, the current distribution is squeezed towards the surface. And at that point, of course, you lose your sensitivity to wall thickness, but you have a much higher sensitivity to the presence of a crack between the electrodes because the perturbation is much bigger. At the same time, you become sensitive uh, to other material properties, for instance, permeability, which also affects the resistivity in ACPD mode. Now, even if you are just sensitive to geometrical properties, let's say wall thickness, needless to say, the resistivity of the material will stay in your uh, equation. So you are always sensitive to the temperature dependence of the, the uh, resistivity that causes a problem. Uh, generally, the higher the, the resistivity of a material, the lower its temperature coefficient. So in this respect, actually, an austenitic steel uh, is the easy one because it has relatively high uh, electric resistivity and uh, also relatively low temperature coefficient. That's why I use this for an illustration purposes. On the top of it, this test was conducted in a laboratory experiments, and if you see the numbers uh, of these experiments uh, uh, for about 20 days, you see that the, the temperature variations were on the order of a few centigrade. Still, if you look at the red line, which is the, the res measured resistance as a function of, of time, there are large oscillations which are associated with the temperature variation in, in the uh, room. Now, what you can do, you can program the computer to learn the actual temperature dependence of the material, and you can use thermocouple wires for injection and sensing purposes, and between the actual measurements, when you inject current, uh, so without current injection, you measure uh, the open circuit voltages between your electrodes, and, and at that point, you essentially measure the temperature of the specimen and use that temperature value to compensate for this, and then you can almost uh, entirely eliminate the temperature variations, and, and then you can see very minute erosion effects which you want to monitor. Another way to, to, to distinguish between geometrical and, and material uh, variations is to use uh, eddy current uh, uh, inspection, which is based on in, in inductive uh, coupling. You have a probe coil uh, driven by uh, an alternating current and, and the changing magnetic field produces an eddy current in the, the specimen. It's non-contacting, but of course you have to be close to the specimen to make it uh, work. And what you really measure is the electric impedance of the probe coil, and that will have a direct correlation with the conductivity. Uh, so basically, uh, based on the measured complex impedance of the probe coil, you can measure uh, the conductivity of the specimen. Of course, this works only if the, the uh, component is regular and homogeneous. Most of the time it isn't. In that case, this direct correlation is violated. For instance, I assumed here that you have a little geometrical irregularity, some kind of a surface roughness. In that case, if you invert the, the coil impedance, you just get an apparent conductivity and that apparent conductivity is the conductivity of a hypothetical regular homogeneous material which would give exactly the right coil impedance. Interestingly, this apparent eddy current conductivity will be frequency dependent, and of course the electrical conductivity is, is frequency independent. Uh, the reason why this will be frequency dependent because frequency controls how deep you go in the material, how much you see this geometrical irregularity. So let's assume that, that, that uh, uh, you 
got rid of the, the strong geometrical effect and you can actually measure the material effect. What are the contributions? Uh, there will be the conductivity of the matrix. Unfortunately, it's highly temperature uh, dependent. There will be residual stress effects, dislocations, coherence strains, precipitates, solute partitioning, and so on. All these are small effects with the exception of the very first one. Therefore, you can combine them uh, by superposition, basically. And if you get rid of this pri uh, primary effect here, the temperature dependence, this is an, a, a reversible change in, in the resistivity, the, the, then you can see these other effects. These other effects are irreversible. You expose the material to high temperature for a certain time, uh, all these things will change, and they stay changed after you remove the temperature. And this is what we need for life prediction purposes. We can use this uh, for residual stress relaxation measurement, precipitate coarsening, uh, solute partitioning, and so on. Let me show you uh, a couple of uh, examples. For instance, creep damage can be inspected uh, uh, by eddy current conductivity measurements. But interestingly, if you just plot the electric conductivity against the creep strain, the correlation is not very good. Why is that? Because creep-resistant materials happen to have very coarse grain structures. Creep damage always starts at the grain boundaries, and, and uh, in order to reduce the susceptibility of the material to creep damage, you just want to eliminate grain boundaries. You, for instance, you, you make uh, the grains very coarse or directionally solidified, or you just use a single uh, uh, crystal material. Uh, it means that the conductivity will change from point to point uh, and this spatial material noise overrides the effect of, of uh, creep. Therefore, rather than just measuring conductivity, what you have to do, you have to measure the conductivity in orthogonal directions, parallel and normal to the primary creep direction, and plot that. That essentially eliminates the inhomogeneity, and you get a very good uh, correlation. So the primary effect of creep is not that it changes the conductivity that much. It makes it anisotropic. Another interesting example is that, that uh, in some cases, the large irreversible temperature effect, that is the microstructural evolution caused by thermal exposure, ca can be exploited. For instance, this is a nickel-based superalloy. The composition is, is listed for this particular case, which we cycled for some time, first up to 800 C, then up to 1,000 C. And what you see here in blue, the temperature, and in red, the uh, resistance. And uh, on the right side uh, of the slide, you can see just the resistance uh, plotted against the temperature. You can see that up to a thousand C, there are large changes. Those are reversible uh, changes due to the temperature variation, but no significant remnant irreversible change. Immediately, you uh, exceed a threshold, which in this case is 1200 C. There is a very significant remnant change in the material. And where this happens can be controlled by, by cooking the, the material right at the composition. So this allows us to build sensors, smart sensors, and place these very rugged sensors in a very hostile environment, for instance, uh, in, a, in the hot section of a combustion, and then evaluate uh, the resistivity of, of each matrix element after exposure and, and uh, uh, detecting which one went through the, their respective transition, we can establish the peak temperature the, 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 uh, at that location during service, which otherwise would not be available. In spite of our best efforts, electrical conductivity measurements will be always sensitive to a combination of geometrical and material effects. The only technique we have which is totally insensitive to geometrical variations is thermoelectric uh, measurement. Uh, there are two ways to do this. This is the, the closed circuit uh, Seebeck effect, the way Seebeck did it uh, originally. Let's assume that, that you have a material with an inclusion of an imperfection where the properties are slightly different from the intact material, and you establish a temperature gradient throughout the sample. It doesn't have to be much. In this case, it's half a centigrade per centimeter. What's going to happen is that because of this temperature uh, gradient, different points at the boundary between the inclusion and, and the intact material will be a different temperature, therefore a different thermoelectric potential. And these little uh, potential differences uh, will produce local 
thermoelectric current loops, which can be detected without touching the specimen by magnetic uh, uh, sensors. To illustrate how perfectly this type of inspection uh, eliminates geometrical variations, let's look at this demonstration. It's a piece of steel, uh, copper, and, and we produced a semi-spherical surface topography by using low stress milling and also by pressing a stainless steel ball into the surface. So the topography is very similar, but in this case, of course, there is more than geometrical variation. You produced plastic deformation, dislocation density, and so on, and you also built up an elastic strain, a residual stress uh, in the material. Now, this plastic deformation and residual stress would change the electric conductivity, let's say, by 1%. And 1% change in conductivity can be easily measured by eddy current means, let's say, if the specimen is flat, but not for such a geometry. However, thermoelectric inspection is totally insensitive to the geometry. As you see, in the case where there is only geometrical uh, change, there is absolutely no signature, and, and the magnetic sensor picks it up very easily. To further prove that, that we are sensitive only to slight material changes, we anneal the specimen, and of course, uh, none of the specimens uh, showed any magnetic signature after Annealing. This can be uh, exploited uh, most obviously for, for residual stress relaxation and, and recrystallization. Here you can see shot pinned copper specimens of different almond uh, intensities. You can see that because it's, this is such a nice single phase material, uh, the magnetic signature is almost linearly proportional to the pinning intensity, and as you expose it to higher and higher temperature, the signature completely disappears. So this can be used to monitor residual stress build up and relaxation. The truth is it doesn't work so well in engineering materials, which tend to be more inhomogeneous. Here is an example of a nickel-based superalloy. Uh, the baseline is not zero because the material itself is thermoelectric inhomogeneous to some degree, even without uh, the pinning. Another way you can use uh, thermoelectric measurements is the open circuit Seebeck effect. This is the effect we use in thermocouples to measure uh, temperature. Basically, you have two electrodes, and one of them is heated, and you measure the voltage difference between them. And the technique is mostly sensitive to chemical uh, variations. So if there are some chemical variations, you're going to pick it up. But most of the time, there aren't any variations. In that case, what you are sensitive to changes in hardness and isotropy and so on. Of course, you cannot use it in this form for, for monitoring purposes. The, therefore, let me show you another configuration. Let's assume that, that you have a specimen to monitor and you attach two K-type thermocouple wires. And you alternatively heat and, uh, uh, the, the, these uh, spots on the, on the left and on the right. If you measure the voltage between the alumel and chromal thermocouple wires, you measure the local temperature, which is shown here. But if you measure the, the, the uh, voltage difference between two alumel wires or two chromal wires, th then you measure the thermoelectric power of the specimen. And this technique can be used uh, for long-term uh, monitoring of, for instance, thermal embrittlement, which is illustrated here. We monitored four specimens. The red one was uh, outside the furnace, but the others were inside the furnace. These are various steel materials. And, and up to 410C, uh, we didn't see any change. Immediately, we increased the temperature to 510C. Thermal embrittlement started, and, and you can see a measurable change in, in thermoelectric uh, power. These are, of course, very small changes relative to what you could measure with that manual probe I showed earlier. But in this case, you have welded electrodes with very good contact to the surface because you, you welded thermocouple uh, wires to, to, to the surface. Now, in the remainder of my uh, talk, I'd like to show you two examples. Both of them represent very minor, subtle materials changes. The first one will be residual stress profiling in surface enhanced uh, metal components. Residual stresses are extremely important for the remaining service life of a component, depending on whether they add to or subtract from the, the 
operational stresses and loads, uh, you can reduce or increase the fatigue life of a component very significantly. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to measure the presence of stresses. Actually, stress is almost impossible to measure directly. Therefore, we call direct measurement a strain measurement because the strain has such a close relationship to stress. Uh, so if you measure the strain, you can calculate the stress, but all these techniques are essentially uh, destructive. For instance, the most commonly used X-ray diffraction technique has only a, a few micro penetration depths in high density metals, and that's not enough even for surface treated components, let alone bulk stress uh, uh, measurements. So if, if you want to measure the residual stress without destroying uh, the surface, you have to rely on indirect physical measurements, and eddy current conductivity measurements are leading candidates in non-magnetic materials for this purpose. The underlying physical phenomena is the piezoresistivity effect I already mentioned in connection with the, the strain gauge. In some materials, the behavior is more or less described by that simple equation uh, I gave you uh, earlier. That means that in compression, the conductivity increases, in tension, it decreases, regardless whether the current is flowing parallel or normal to the stress direction. Uh, there are, unfortunately, other materials where the mobility plays a more important role, and in that case, normal to the stress, the conductivity uh, decreases, and parallel to the stress, it's increasing. This is bad news if you have an isotropic or plain isotropic state of stress, for instance, produced by shot pinning or laser pinning, because the stress is the same in every direction, so these two effects will almost cancel each other. Uh, any current conductivity measurements can be used uh, for, for uh, monitoring stress relaxation in, in, in nickel-based superalloys. For instance, this is a WASP alloy material uh, pinned to a certain uh, intensity, RMM8, and then uh, repeatedly exposed to ever-increasing temperatures for 24 hours. And uh, as you can see, uh, the conductivity appears to increase with frequency. I mentioned this before, when the apparent eddy current conductivity increases with frequency, it doesn't mean that the conductivity is frequency dependent. It means that the current is squeezed closer to the surface and the conductivity is higher at the surface. Uh, that's the reason of, of this effect. The more important thing is that, that, that uh, with relaxation, the effect completely disappears. So you can monitor the relaxation of residual uh, stress. In some cases, this technique is also suitable for, for quantitative assessment and profiling of, of residual stresses. Uh, this is also a, a WASP alloy, but this time low plasticity burnished. The red symbols are the eddy current conductivity data, and, and, and the, the blue symbols are the X-ray diffraction results. This, this is a destructive test. Uh, and, and here you can see the plastic deformation caused by the surface treatment, and this is the residual stress profile. If you evaluate this eddy current uh, conductivity change in terms of the non piezo resistivity of the material, uh, you can pretty accurately uh, uh, recover the residual st stress profile in a non-destructive way. Uh, however, there are problems here. You can see uh, uh, the apparent eddy current conductivity spectra in a, a different uh, nickel-based superalloy, ion-718, uh, which is precipitation hardened to different degrees. Uh, everything works pretty much the same way as in the previous case, up to about 35 Rockwell hardness, but above it, there is a dramatic uh, reduction uh, due to this hardening and actually an inversion uh, uh, of, of uh, the sign. Uh, which simply means that, that, that you are not just sensitive to residual stress. Of course, you are sensitive to precipitate uh, hardening as well. And what can I say? Nothing is perfect, and uh, NDE is certainly not perfect. Uh, but it, it works in some cases, and if you are very careful, you can use it to great benefit. Uh, the second example I want to show you is a health monitoring type of application, in-situ creep monitoring using potential drop techniques. Uh, creep damage at high temperature uh, initiates as isolated cavities at the grain boundaries. Later, they form oriented clusters of cavities. Then the grain boundaries actually separate. You're going to have distributed microcracks. Uh, 
uh, they coalesce into a large crack that rapture occurs. There are numerous techniques are, that are capable uh, to detect this damage. Replication is, a, is an industrial technique. It's basically a surface topography inspection. Artasonics is used. By the way, I should point out that, that the, the solid line here shows uh, a verified validity, uh, and the dashed line means that it might have some sensitivity, but uh, it's not assured, so that's an uncertain range. Uh, positron annihilation, magnetics can be used in ferromagnetic uh, materials and some hardness measurements. It's a surface measurement, of course, and somewhat uh, uh, destructive. Newton scattering. Interestingly, uh, electric resistivity measurements fare very well, but they are not sensitive enough early on when the changes are insignificant and not monotonic. The only technique which works from the very beginning is the strain measurement. However, at the very end, the strain measurement doesn't tell you how close you are to failure because it's not related to damage. Therefore, our approach is to combine these two and use a dual mode inspection. Basically, we measure the electric resistivity in two directions, orthogonal to each other, and this helps us to eliminate the uh, reversible temperature effect. When you go up from room temperature to creep temperature, let's say 650 centigrade, the uh, electric resistivity will change 100 or maybe 200 percent. It's a very large effect. Fortunately, it's isotropic. It changes the resistivity in every direction by the same amount. The way we can get rid of it is we divide the two measured uh, resistances and actually consider uh, the resistance ratio as our ND indicator. This resistance ratio initially starts to increase simply because due to the creep deformation, the aspect ratio of this originally square electrode configuration changes a little. So it's like a high temperature strain gauge. But later on, you start to be sensitive to the uh, material effect, which is an increasing uh, an isotropy in the material. And then we evaluate this resistance ratio, assuming that there are only geometrical changes. That gives up something which we call the DACPD, directional ACPD strain. This will be pretty much the local strain initially, but later it will be an overestimation of the local strain because the material damage is added to it. The measurement is done by spot welding simple thermocouple wires uh, uh, to the specimen, and, and in field application we use actually stud welding, which is a little more uh, robust. And here you can see an example in an IT1 uh, chromium molybdenum steel at 650C at different uh, uh, load levels. Uh, for, for given load levels, there are more than one lines to indicate the reproducibility. Uh, you can detect the, the, the increase in creep very early on, and certainly you can detect uh, the imminent failure when the material damage uh, causes an unreasonable high apparent strain in the material. Okay, now in conclusion, I, I hope I could convince you that electromagnetic methods offer a really unique opportunity for materials evaluation and structural health monitoring. A variety of very simple and rugged sensors can be built based on this principle. And really, you don't need anything but connecting wires because you use the material itself as a sensor. These sensors can detect and even quantitatively characterize very subtle environmentally assisted and service-related uh, damage in the material. And in most cases, uh, the sensitivity is sufficient. You don't need any special uh, instrumentation for the purposes of monitoring. There are, of course, some problems. As far as challenges, uh, the main problem is, is the feasibility of the technique depends uh, uh, on selectivity. It's not that you are not sensitive enough to what you want to measure, it's that you are also sensitive to other things. So it requires a good understanding of what might go wrong in that situation where you are doing the monitoring to interpret the data. And although I didn't have time to, to spend much time on it, I have to acknowledge that the ultimate challenge, of course, is to integrate uh, these results with life prediction 
uh, techniques to, to reach the original goal we set out for ourselves. And with this, thank you very much for your attention. If I have some time, I would be happy to answer some questions.